Hello, so welcome to lecture four of our mini course for the Brazilian Colloquium, our mini course on dynamics of circle mappings. So right now we are entering the fourth part of our book. So the fourth part is part is about rigidity and renormalization. And this is what I will try to start to discuss in this lecture. Lecture five will be still about renormalization theory. So these last two lectures will be about renormalization theory. This lecture will focus more on real results, real meaning the real line. And uh, the last lecture, lecture five, will be about holomorphic results, and holomorphic methods in one dimensional dynamics, in general in dynamical systems. Okay? So, okay, so let me start to talk about smooth rigidity, which is mainly the main motivation for studying multi critical circle maps. Remember that uh, in lecture three, Edson ha has been. He has introduced uh, multi-critical circle maps. He talked about the real bounds, the QS rigidity, and I will recall some of that stuff. But you know, the subject now is smooth rigidity. And you know, the notion of smooth rigidity comes from, it, it's borrowed, it's just a, a notion. There won't be a, a precise definition of what we mean by smooth rigidity, but it is, it's a term which is borrowed from hyperbolic geometry. So you have most all rigidity in hyperbolic manifolds uh, of dimension at least three, right? Uh, where, where you have this phenomenon, right? Think of compact uh, three manifolds, hyperbolic three manifolds. Uh, the topology of the system determines the geometry of the system, right? So what do we mean uh, by this in dynamics? So let me give an idea. So for us, rigidity means that a finite number of dynamical invariants determines the geometry, or what I wrote here, the fine scale structure of orbits, okay? So uh, an example of this we already know from these lectures, from this series of lectures, is smooth rigidity for circle diffuse with diophantine rotation number. So remember, if you have two, say, analytic diffuses uh, with the same irrational rotation number of the Jordan type, then you know that they are conjugate to each other by a diffeomorphism, actually by an analytic diffeomorphism in this case. So this is what we mean by this expression, the topology of the system determines its geometry. So for circle homeos, the topology of the system is, is contained in the rotation number, right? And then what we are saying is that if you have the same rotation number, then you have the same geometry because having a diffeomorphism conjugate, you know, remember that any orbit is dense for these guys. So you have a dense sequence of iterates in the circle. And then what we are saying is that you have a sequence for F, you have a sequence for G, say, and then you have a diffio identifying this guy, a circle diffio, global circle diffio identifying these orbits. So this is rigidity. And in fact, it is, it is for circle diffios, we will discuss right now rigidity for critical circle maps. But let me just say for circle diffios, it's, it's kind of even stronger, right? The combinatorics of the system determines the geometry. If you have these two guys, the, the fact that they have the same rotation number of, of diophantine, uh, the rotation number is a combinatorial information. It tells you uh, something about the order of the orbits, how they order in the circle. So the same combinatorics implies that you have a diffio conjugating one to the other. Uh, so this is what we saw, for instance, uh, Edson gave a detailed proof of Arnold's result, and then he gave all these statements, Katz Nelson, Ornstein, Herman, your boss, of course, Hany Taplinski. You have seen a lot of examples of statements about this. You need to remember the following. So take two diffuses, A, F, and G, analytic, say infinity, whatever, and with uh, the, the same diophantan rotation number. As you know, you take X and you take Y, and there is a unique conjugacy identifying X with Y and, and conjugating F with G, right? Which in principle is just a homeomorphism, 
remember how you construct this conjugacy. You have the orbit of x and you have the orbit of y, the orbit of x under f and the orbit of y under g. Since the order is the same, you can define a map identifying each uh, corresponding iterates, the third iterate of x under f with the third iterate of y under g. And then this map is monotone. I'm thinking on the lift to the real line. It is monotone because precisely the order of the orbits is the same. And then, okay, if it is monotone, we can extend it continuously to the closure of, of these two orbits, right? The extension is C0, it's continuous. And then, of course, since these two orbits are dense, because our guys are minimal, uh, this uh, has been extended to the whole circle. So you have a homeomorphism, a C0 identification which comes just from extending a monotone map. So it is kind of a surprise, it should be quite surprising, the fact that this homeomorphism that I just construct is in fact a D field, provided in the case of uh, circle D fields, the, you need this diophantine condition, right? So we are looking for the same phenomena here. So let me be more precise about this. So, what is a uh, rigidity maps which are topologically conjugate and they share this finite number of invariants and I, I need to say something what, what i mean by this of course the rotation number will be one of those so maps which are topologically conjugate they should be in fact smoothly conjugate this is rigidity this is the rigidity that we are looking for and you may think okay but why you are i mean why you are expecting this rigidity in the context of critical circle maps and then, well, there is some, some history here, but you know, I'm not saying too much, but uh, this was uh, suggested by numerical observations developed by theoretical physicists and mathematicians uh, in the early 80s, that they realized that uh, you should expect uh, a smooth conjugacy, at least when you deal with critical circle maps, C3 critical circle maps, uh, with a single critical point, and with bounded combinatorics. This was a, a conjecture, a rigidity conjecture. I put here carried out by some physicists, but I will mention these guys in the next uh, slide. You know, here uh, it is Eigenbaum, uh, you, you have Kadanov, Lanford, many names, that they say that at least in the bounded type case, you should expect rigidity. Uh, they, they make this conjecture. So, in order to, I, I will state the conjecture already for multi critical circle maps. So let me put some names here. This was kind of just a philosophical thought. So I will fix some data. Let us fix the number of critical points. You can think of one critical point, two critical points, three critical points. Of course, this corresponds to different scenarios. You will not uh, look for a DFO conjugating, you know, one guy with two critical points and this guy with three critical points, of course. So, let us fix capital M, at least one, we need critical points here. We don't want diffuse anymore. And, uh, and let us fix the criticality. Remember these numbers, uh, this uh, I, uh, bigger than one, it, uh, will denote the criticalities at each critical point. And let us fix these guys. Again, if, if you have a diff, you're conjugating the two dynamical systems, you have two critical points, the criticalities has to be the same. So let us fix these uh, coordinates. Are not so interesting. Keep moving these guys will be so interesting. And then, okay, let, let's take F will be a C3 multi critical circle map with exactly N critical points C0, C1, blah, 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 with those criticalities that uh, which affects. And let's say that the rotation number is rho and it has a unique invariant measure that we denote by mu, the standard notation, the same one as in the book. And then I will define the signature, I hope. You already read the book, so if, if you're watching this, you already know what is the signature, but let me remind you what it is. Uh, is this, uh, say, this vector with n numbers? So the number of critical points uh, will give an n vectors, as you see. And the first coordinate, it is just the rotation number. Of course, if you want a diffeomorphism conjugating f with g, first of all, you need a home, so they, they have to have the same rational rotation number. Remember that. Rotation number is a dynamical invariant. We learned this in the first lecture. But then the numbers that you will put is that these little alphas, alpha sub e, 
which are the measures. So you have the critical set, it is a finite set, and then you have the arcs uh, connecting uh, uh, consecutive critical points. And then you can measure these arcs with your unique invariant measure, okay? So uh, alpha i is the measure mu of the interval uh, between the critical points uh, ci and ci plus one, okay? You measure all these guys and you write uh, these numbers that you get on a vector. Of course, I didn't put the last one because, you know, the mu is a probability measure. So the measure of the last uh, arc of the last interval is just one minus the sum of the previous one, right? So you don't need it. If, if you have fixed all of this, then the last one is fixed. So you don't need to put it on the signature. It's kind of redundant. And, uh, and remember, of course, uh, how you measure these intervals well. Think, uh, I hope this is clear in the book, the measure is the same as the conjugacies. I mean, if you want to measure this, you can think of a conjugacy sending you, uh, conjugating your, your critical circle map F with a rotation. And then you take the critical points. This gives you some points, of course, regular points, because here you are acting with the rotation. And then you measure with the Lebesgue measure. This is the Euclidean length of this interval. Okay, this is the measure mu, because these guys are uniquely ergodic, and Lebesgue is the unique invariant measure for the rotation. Right? I hope this is already quite clear. Otherwise, you should stop this video and go back to the basic material. And uh, anyway, so this is the signature. And why I define this? Well, let us take another. So uh, right now we have f. Let's take a multi-critical circle map G with the same number, capital M of critical points. The criticalities are the same. And of course, uh, let G with a rotation number rho. So we know that there is topological conjugacies between F and G. And then you can say, okay, I, if I'm looking for conjugacies which are diffuse, I need a conjugacy identifying critical points, right? Critical points has to be identified with critical points, otherwise you don't have diffuse conjugating. This is just a, a chain rule. So good, the problem is the following. Let's take, I don't know, C0 of F and you know C0 of G. And then you, you define, uh, as I was previously explaining, you define a conjugacy identifying C0 of F with C0 of G, and this, that's it, that uh, uniquely determines your consumers. You have no more freedom, right? So it will be a miracle if the other critical points are mapped to critical points, right? You, you don't have control of this, unless you fix these measures. So a little lemma here, which is kind of elementary, there exists a, a topological consumacy identifying critical points, if and only if these little alpha are the same. And why? Because of what I was saying before. This alpha are just, if you want, go to the rotation and measure with the Euclidean length, with the Lebesgue measure, okay? So if you fix the signature, you certainly have a topological conjugacy identifying corresponding critical points. This is the unique, the only conjugacy that has some chance to be smooth. And then, you know, the conjecture is that I call, we call it rigidity conjecture, same signature implies smooth conjugacy. This homeomorphism that identifies the critical point should be a diffusion. And again, of course, what I'm stating this conjecture, it makes sense, but, but you, you don't state a conjecture only because it makes sense, this has a history. And then, you know, this was formulated, as I was saying, in the early 80s by, groups of people uh, independently, right? Lanford, Feigenbaum, Kadanov, Schenker, Rand, a lot of mathematicians and physicists uh, working with uh, the boundary of chaos. Remember that critical circle maps appear naturally as the boundary of chaos, chaos meaning positive topological uh, This is uh, some uh, explained in chapter uh, six, probably. Yeah, hope so some chapter. Okay, so this is the recent conjecture. It was formulated in the case of a single critical point. So in the case of a single critical point, this is much easier. The signature is just the rotation number. 
because you don't have other critical points, you know, to measure arcs, there are no arcs. You have one critical point and the rest of the circle is made up by regular points. So in the case of critical points, the rigidity conjecture was, if you have the same irrational rotation number of bounded time, because the conjecture was formulated, was posed for bounded combinatorics, then your guys should be smoothly conjugated. So let me give you right now uh, good news, nice results. Uh, all we know about smooth rigidity of multi-critical circle maps, and as you will see, and this is kind of, uh, you know, it's always the case, we know much more in the case of a single critical point than in the general multi-critical case. You know. So let me give you two rigidity results for unicritical circle maps, meaning uh, critical circle maps with a single critical point. And the first one, it was the precise statement of the rigidity conjecture. So these guys in the early 80s wrote specifically this conjecture, which is nowadays a theorem. And it says that in the C3 class uh, and with bounded combinatorics, any two critical circle maps are conjugate to each other via C1 plus alpha diffeomorphism. So your diffuse, a C1 diffuse, has a derivative, and the derivative is held uh, of exponent alpha. And if you go back to the papers of these guys, the conjecture was as precise as you can see. It, it, the, the, the conjecture was that the consumacy was C1 plus alpha, but probably not C2. It, was, uh, it is amazing. I mean, a very specific conjecture. And now it's a theorem. This is a theorem, the first uh, rigidity result that I want to share right now. And this is, of course, is for bounded combinatorics. Remember that bounded type numbers, uh, you know, they have zero level measure. So as soon as you have this, you want to get rid of this condition. And then the good news is that you can, you do can, but you need one more derivative. So the next result uh, is for any irrational rotation number, but it's for C4 uh, dynamic. So second theorem, if you have C4, critical circle maps, again, with a single critical point, then, and with any irrational rotation number, then they are conjugate to each other by a C1 diffeomorphism. Moreover, for Lebesgue, almost every rotation number, the conjugacy is actually C1 plus alpha. So you recover the C1 plus alpha statement for Lebesgue, almost every rotation number, and in the general case, you just have C1. Uh, of course, you might say, well, maybe it's always C1 plus alpha. And, uh, and the question is no. And I hope you already know that because there are uh, there is a detailed construction of counterexamples in chapter 11, but whatever, if you don't remember, there are counterexamples to C1 plus alpha rigidity. And in fact, even for analytic dynamics. So uh, in the C infinity case, it was Edson and Wellington uh, who construct this example, and then Arturo Avila construct examples in the analytic class. So you have two real analytic critical circle maps with a single critical point. They are conjugate to each other, of course, by a C1 diffeomorphism because of the previous theorem, if you want. But the consumers is not C1 plus alpha for any alpha. So indeed, there are a bad rotation. Uh, just let me warn you, you might, you might be saying, well, probably the full Lebesgue measure sets are the Diophan times and the bad guys are Liouville or something like that. It is not. Of course, you can intersect two level measures, full level measure sets, and you will have a full level measure set. But I mean, it's not exactly that. And I will define this set in a few moments. You will see that is a different kind of definition, which also holds for Lebe, holds for Lebe, almost every irrational number. Let me say two more things before go to the next slide. The first one is that in both cases the criticality has to be an odd integer. In both theorems, the, cri the critical point has to be, you know, cubic or order five, seven, nine, whatever, any odd integer, but nothing in the middle. We do not know how to prove these results for any criticality between irrational. And uh, I, I can make some comment later. It will be clear still in lecture four why this is true, why this is needed. So. It should be true for any criticality. Sorry, let me be clear here. But we were only able to prove it in the odd integer case. 
And uh, and the next remark is that you know there is this C4 condition here. This second theorem should be true, most likely true uh, for C3 dynamics. You know, we weren't able to prove it. We need this for derivative. It will be clear why. And then you know, this is what we know right now. These are uh, the two theorems that I want to share in the unicritical case. What about multi-critical case? Well, uh, this is a start, you know, to growing uh, our understanding of the multi-critical case, and there is a result that I want to share for bicritical circle maps. So in the case that you have two critical points, for real analytic guys and with bounded combinatorics, we do have a rigidity. So the theorem is the third uh, rigidity result that I want to share says that if you have real analytic by critical circle maps, and here both critical points uh, you has to be have to be cubed. And, and if you have bounded combinatorics, then you do have a C1 plus alpha diffio conjugate. So you have C1 plus alpha rigidity for by critical circle maps with bounded combinatorics, at least in the real analytic class. And this is a uh, 2020, so this is kind of a really recent result. Uh, 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 quite an important first paper by Misha Jampolsky, which is one of the most important names for critical circle maps. And then there is a paper by Misha himself with Gabriela Steves and Daniel Guzmania. And then you need yet another paper that uh, we wrote with Gabriela Steves to, to finally have this statement, this particular statement that I put here. Let me say that these two theorems that I stated before, as it will be clear in these lectures, uh, you know, th th this final formulation that I'm writing here were proved with uh, Wellington de Mello and also with Marco Martens here in the second one, but they build up on previous papers, previous results by several guys that will appear on the, the, this lecture, but it includes certainly Edson de Faria, other papers by Wellington de Mello, Misha Jampolsky, Han Teplinski, a lot of people is involved in, you know, previous results we were able, you know, to finally put in this study. And, you know, somehow these three results, uh, you know, are, you know, can be regarded as the state of the art. This is a nice expression that mathematicians like to use concerning smooth rigidity. So this is what we know right now about smooth rigidity. And you know, we will. I will try here and, and also in lecture five with Ed. So we will try to explain the proof of this stuff, at least in unicritical case. So these two results, uh, we will try to explain the proofs are, are quite complicated. And some parts we will not even try to discuss it here in the lectures because we don't have so much time. You know, this mini course is only five lectures. But then in the book, uh, these things are are much better explained. Of course. This is the fourth part of the book. It's completely devoted, if you want, to the proof of these results. And all of these results, just as is usually the case in rigidity, follows from understanding uh, and, uh, and specific a suitably defined renormalization operator. So there will be an infinite dimensional operator that understanding these guys allows you to conclude this smooth rigidity results, okay? So now we enter into this big subject, uh, which is renormalization theory. And you know what it is renormalization? Well, let me be kind of philosophical at the beginning. So usually renorm to renormalize a dynamical system means the following. First of all, usually you have a, a mark point, an important point, for us will be a critical point, and it is usually the case. And then you will say that your map is renormalizable, that you can renormalize your map if the following happens. You have some neighborhood around your mark point such that you start to iterate and at some point it returns. So you have a first return map well defined in some neighborhood of your mark point. Okay? If this happens, you will take this return map and you will extract it from extracted from the original dynamical system and it, and, it, and it is a dynamical system itself that you you will call the renormalization of the previous one okay so i will explain much more carefully the definition but 
just to, uh, this is the philosophy, and you, there are a lot of renormalization schemes. Uh, the most, uh, I mean, the original one probably is for unimodal maps in the interval. Then you have quadratic line maps for complex dynamics, uh, Lorentz map, uh, internal exchange transformation, maps with breakpoints, well, multimodal maps. In several uh, scenarios in one dimensional dynamics, especially with critical points, uh, people try to define some type, some kind of uh, re renormalization operator. I will explain in a minute. Uh, carefully the one that we will use here. But this is the, the philosophy. And then, of course, you can think of this as a, as a supra-dynamical system, right? Because after you renormalize, you have, again, a new dynamical system, and this guy might be renormalizable. And then you renormalize it, and maybe this guy is again renormalizable, and then you renormalize. So you have a dynamical system, which is called a renormalization operator, acting on the space of your original dynamical system, those that you were interested in. Of course, the phase space will be the guys that uh, at least one renormalizable, right? You, you need to be able to renormalize. This is your phase space. But then, of course, uh, you already see that we will be in some problems. At least we will need to face some difficulties because the phase space of this supra-dynamical system it's a functional space. It will be an infinite dimensional space. And then you will not have some nice properties that we usually like in, you know, when you study, you know, dynamical system acting on compact metric spaces or whatever, you will not have not even locally compactness here. So then we will see it in a moment. But then just to say, okay, but why we are entering in this uh, crazy world? Well, there is kind of a fundamental principle that I will provide specific statements in a few minutes, which is the following. So you have these two guys, uh, and you start to renormalize. You have F and G. You want to prove that you have a smooth rigidity between them. And you start to renormalize, and you start to renormalize, and you start to renormalize the original guys. If these renormalization orbits converge together exponentially fast in some metric, CR metric, then you can conclude that the original dynamics work smoothly conjugate. Okay? So you conclude the smoothness of the conjugacy, not dealing directly with the conjugacy, somehow forgetting about it and, and just proving, just proving that these orbits are converging exponentially fast. Why these holds were, you know, remember what I was saying. You take this return, you make some zoom. To, to recover some big space, right? Because the neighborhoods can be quite small, the neighborhoods that you can, that you have these returns. And then you look for a, a new neighborhood and its return, and then you zoom, and then, you know, you're rescaling the whole time. So uh, somehow the renormalization operator, uh, a lot of people say this is like a microscope, right? You are looking, you are rescaling and rescaling and rescaling. And then if things are converging together, it means that your, your top original topological conjugacy in a small scale is behaving like an affine map. And then uh, if this really happened at an exponential rate, you can prove, but this is a theorem that I will state, that the original guy was in fact a IFIO. Otherwise, if it is not a IFIO, the orbits should have different geometries. And at some point, after zooming and zooming and zooming, the normalization operator will realize this difference and this guy will diverge. Okay? This is the idea. This was just philosophy. So now I want to define what it is, specifically the normalization operator for circle homeos with irrational tension number, which is our setting. So to do that, I, I like to make some draw. So I will do it on the not on the slides, but on the tablet. So now we are going to the tablet to, you know, just to play a little bit and have more fun, and then we come back to, to the slides. So let me stop here. The report, and we go to the tablet right now. Okay, great. Hi again. So we are in the middle of lecture four. Uh, we are talking about uh, renormalization theory, smooth rigidity and renormalization theory. We will be talking about renormalization until the the end of this uh, series of lectures. So lecture five will also be about renormalization. But 
from the holomorphic viewpoint, way. So right now, what I was saying, what I want to do here uh, is to explain the, the basic, the very basic definition of the renormalization operator for the circumvents. So I, I prefer to, to do it on the tablet. I think it will be more fun. I hope you, you agree. So, you know, to make some draw, and have some fun. Now, as I was saying, uh, what it means, the philosophy of renormalization, usually, you have your dynamical system, you have a, a marked point, an important point, for us will be a critical point. In, in many situations in one dimensional dynamics, both real and complex, uh, the marked point will be a critical point. And then you want to take a return map. So you have your critical point, you have some neighborhood, you start to iterate your dynamical system, at some point it comes back, otherwise you have no way to define renormalization. If it's, if it's not coming back, you, you will not say that your map is renormalizable. But if it comes back, then you can take this whole composition, this return map, and maybe do some rescaling, and you have a new dynamical system, which is iterating the whole return map. This new dynamical system is the renormalization of the previous one. So this is the philosophy. But of course, in, in any specific setting, in any context that you are playing with, you need to define it properly for this context. So you have unimodal maps, multimodal maps, Lorentz-like maps, interval exchange transformation. In holomorphic dynamics, you will see quadratic-like maps and so on. And here we have circle dynamics. So how do you do it for circle dynamics? And you see, we will face some interesting situation, which is the following. We are dealing with irrational uh, rotation numbers. So if you take a mark point, and you take a neighborhood of it, this guy cannot come back to itself. Otherwise, the boundary point will be periodic. But then we know that we don't have periodic orbit. So somehow the real maps uh, will not be continuous, or at least we will need to break it up in two pieces. So I want to explain this uh, in the talk, and then we will come back to, to the beam representation, to the slides. So let's see what we are saying here. We have, you know, some irrational, let's call it rho, is irrational. And then for us, f, let us call f, is just the rotation by angle rho. I'm using the notation of our book, right? From S1 to S1. It is just the rotation by the irrational angle rho. So I will do everything for the rotation, just because it, it is more clear. But then, of course, everything that I will do is combinatorial. So uh, you will see, and I will explain this more carefully, but everything uh, you can transport it for any homeomorphism which is topologically conjugate to this rotation. So if you have a homeomorphism, for instance, a multi-critical circle map uh, with irrational rotation number, then we already know by Yoko theorem from lecture three, Edson uh, has uh, explained that, that it's topologically conjugate to the rotations. So everything that I do here can do it there, of course, uh, using any topological consequence. So, but for me, it will be easy here in, in, in this tablet, you know, to deal just with the rotation. So, and then we will have a marked point here. It's not so clear, but you have a marked point. So if it is a rotation, you know, we, we, which point is interesting? All of them are the same, but let's say x0 equal to 1, OK? In the case of a critical circle map, we will take a critical point. And then, of course, we always have a Gonshu as it taking the crit identifying your critical point with the point one. So this, it doesn't matter. And then, OK, so you have this dynamical system. You have a unit circle, this guy, x0. You have here the action of f. And the question here is how it looks. Remember, F is just the original rotation, but I, I will call it F just to simplify, otherwise I need to have this little row uh, all the time. So how it looks, the first return map of F to some neighborhood, we don't know which one, uh, to X0. So this is the thing, because as I was saying, this is the spirit of renormalization. So 
how can we play in this case? Okay. Okay, let's see. Okay, it's good over there, it's good over there. Good. So let's see. And then, of course, this is a rigid rotation, so it cannot be so difficult. Everything that I will do here is kind of elementary, but you need to do it uh, once in your life. So actually, after you watch this video, maybe even before, you, you should be able to do, you know, to play this game by yourself, and, and then you will see clearly the, the whole picture. Otherwise, you know, it's kind of, it looks mysterious, but it is not. So, okay, so we have the circle. Whoa. Oh, okay, yeah. We have the circle, then you have X zero, and then you know, you rotate a little bit. Let's think, that, so this distance, this little interval, this fundamental domain is, is the angle rope because this is just a rotation. And then you have the second iterate of X zero, and the, this fundamental domain has, of course, the same length, and then you keep going, and then you know, you go, you go, you go, and at some point, depending on how long is, is your fundamental domain, you will be here. Let me let me try to do a, this picture here. So, say that you have here, I will define a number R for return, so this is R0 minus one, and then here you have FR0, and then the next one is on the other side. This is R0 plus one, of x0, okay? So r0 is defined to be the guy that goes uh, through the other side, okay? So it is, just to be clear, it is a natural number such that f r0 is, is less than x0, but then r0 plus one, it's already on the other side. So this order comes from the, from the circle, right? Okay, there we are again. I'm sorry, I, I, I had some problems. I don't know if it is the internet connection. I wasn't seeing, I was writing on my tablet, but it, it didn't appear on the, on the screen, so now it's there. So this was the definition of uh, uh, R0. I hope it, it was clear, I don't know. Then you go through the other side, uh, you know, you iterate, you iterate, and then at some point uh, you are here this last guy and then the next one is on the other side x0 which was our important guy okay so this is the definition of r0 okay good and uh, then it is a natural number uh, with with this property you iterate r0 r0 times sorry you are still on this side of x0 and then you are on the other side the order comes from the real line you can think of believe so this is here the definition and the claim is the following claim we already know who is this guy, claim R0 is just A0. Uh, remember A0 from uh, the linear fraction expansion of rho. Okay, so the claim is that this guy is the first coefficient in the continuous fraction expansion. Remember from the second part of lecture one uh, that we were discussing about continuous fraction expansion, the, the very basic definition. So my claim is that this guy is exactly, this guy R0 is exactly, and this is kind of obvious. So let me give a proof here, very elementary proof. So remember, I have this formula that is written over there, R0 plus one of X0. But then what this means, you can see it here. Remember that these fundamental domains, they all have the same length, so, R0 times rho is less than one, but if you go one more step with rho, you are on the other side, right? F is just a rigid rotation. So this is what it means. And then if you divide by rho, you will see that R0 is less than one over rho, but R0 plus one is uh, greater than one. And then of course, if you take the inverse here and the order, you have the following expression. I'm just taking the inverse. And then what this means, remember, there is a name for these intervals. This was uh, MR0. Remember, these are the fundamental domains for the Gauss map, where the Gauss map expands and covers the whole zero one. So these are the 
elements of the Markov partition that we were discussing on lecture one about the Gauss map. So this was the definition of the continuum fraction expansion, at least our definition it was a dynamical definition. And then you can see clearly that if rho goes to MR0, this means that the continuum fraction expansion starts with this guy, right? Of course, you can also see from here, let me just show you. Yellow is good, but then, uh, of course, if you're here, uh, this is this just means that R0 is the integer of our row. It's a uh, classical definition, if you want, it's the same thing, right? Okay. So this is the proof, very easy, but then we know this, uh, just to come back, this guy, R0, which is the, the guy that goes uh, the, the last iterate before passing to the other side, is exactly A0. And of course, uh, this iterate is not X0, right? Because you cannot come back to the original point because there are no periodic orbits in our dynamic system. This is an irrational rotation, right? These two points are, are really creating a neighborhood around X0. Okay. And then, you know, uh, we, we will use uh, these iterates to create a, a, a suitable neighborhood for our return map. So uh, let me put some names, which are traditional here. So let me draw again our circle. And then this, this guy was x0. And then uh, this guy was f of x0. And then on the other side, we appear closely with this f a0 of x0. This interval is smaller because the iterate went to the other side than x0. OK, so this interval has uh, have names. This guy will be called I0, and this guy will be called I1, OK? And then let me remind you also from lecture one, uh, by definition, I hope you remember this. I hope this is already clear. Otherwise, maybe you should go back and watch that video before watching this one. But then Q0, it was 1, and Q1, it was A0, and now it will be, it will be clear why. These are the iterates that are appearing here. So I can draw, right? This was the definition. And then we have a, a recursive formula to define Qn plus 1 in terms of Qn and Qn minus 1, whatever. So you have this. Let me draw it in, in this way. If this guy is X0, I will draw here FQ0 of X0, which is just F x0, and this guy is fq1 of x0, which is just fa0 of x0, okay? And as I say, I'm putting some names, this interval is i0, and this interval is i1. I'm just, you know, cutting the circle, looking at these guys. So these intervals, these two intervals here, this is the neighborhood that I'm interested in, okay? Forgetting you know, the rest, the rest was the whole e uh, sequence of iterates uh, for the rational rotation until you appear closely on the other side. Okay, good. And then uh, in these uh, two intervals, we have a return map, which is actually a pair of maps. Again, you don't have return maps, continuous return map, because if a, a one dimensional continuous map, takes any interval uh, into or onto itself, then it has a periodic orbit. And we don't have here. We saw that on lecture one. But you have uh, some sort of uh, return map. So let me put these guys back here. These are the same intervals. These are standard pictures in this area. And then, you know, if I take uh, I0, I will have some iterate here. I'm iterating here uh, FQN. And remember, this is just FA0. And on the other side, I'm taking I1, and I will iterate. Sorry, I hope this is, yeah, this is readable. This is, uh, uh, sorry, blah, blah, blah. this is just F, right? So this is FQ0, which is, in this case, is just F. So I1 appears somewhere here. And then I0 appears. Let me use the colors that we have, sorry. So the, the green comes to the green. And let's say, you know, yellow. A0 is the yellow, 
comes here. Okay, so there is a return map. These two intervals come back to themselves, but of course they are different iterates. FQ0 applied to I1, FQ1 applied to A0. So, okay, but this is a return map with a discontinuity, but we already knew that. So let's put some names here. Okay, sorry, good. So uh, the, the first return maps is actually a pair of maps. I would like to call it the renormalization of F, but let me put a little P here, which is the pre-renormalization. I will explain why in just a minute. And this is just by definition, FQ0 restricted to A1, FQ1 restricted to A0. Okay, this is the definition of the pre-renormalization of F, and it is what we were looking for, this A first return map to a neighborhood of our marked point. In this case, since we are dealing with rotations, it's just any point. And it is important to see that, that everything is combinatorial. This Q0, Q1, A0, all these numbers, they only depend on what? They only depend, sorry, on rho, on the rotation. And the only thing that we are using is the order of the orbits. Remember our definition, it was like, okay, this point is still on the left, but the next one will be on the right. I'm saying left and right, you know, just in, in terms of my picture here. So everything is combinatorial. So it, it, actually, you don't need to be a rotation. This, this just holds for any circle map topologically consuet to this specific rotation by angle row. And in fact, there is an, a, a, a claim that I, that I would like to mention here. So claim. I don't know the one that I'm using. Claim it was in blue before, so let's use blue just to be co coherent. So claim. So the, the Euclidean length of I0 is equal to rho, and the Euclidean length of I1 is equal to rho time times, sorry, Gauss of rho. Okay? So you have these two things. I will explain right now why this is true. And then you may say, okay, but you were saying that everything uh, in, in this uh, part uh, will be combinatorial and so on. And th this claim doesn't look uh, combinatorial at all, right? Because I'm, I'm talking about the Euclidean length of some intervals. But remember, uh, so the Euclidean length is just a Lebesgue measure, right? So you can say that I'm talking about the Lebesgue measure of these two intervals. And remember that when you have a, a general formula F, topologically contrary to this guy, it is uniquely ergodic. You have a unique invariant measure that we usually denote in our book and lectures by mu. And then we know that to measure an interval with your measure mu is just the same that to take it with a conjugacy to the rotation and use the Lebesgue measure because Lebesgue measure is a unique invariant measure for an irrational rotation, right? So this claim is saying that the, for the, your unique invariant measure, the measures of I0 and I1 are given respectively by rho and rho times Gauss of rho. Okay, so this is still uh, important, relevant, and general information. And why? Well, the fact that I0 has length rho is, is obvious because we are iterating a rotation. Remember, so if you are iterating a rotation, we are rotating by rho. So this is kind of obvious. And the next one is also kind of clear because the length of I1, remember I1, it was this uh, little piece missing here after all the iterates, right? This one here. So I1 is uh, the total length of the circle, which of course, thinking it is one, minus all the previous iterates. So it was a, a zero times rho, right? So you have all these little intervals, they all have length rho, you're going through the circle, you have a zero intervals of length rho, and then a one is was the missing part. So its length is one minus a zero times rho, and then this is clear, but you know, it's trick here. This is one over rho minus a zero times rho. But then a zero is just the integer part of one over rho. 
So this is rho times the fractional part of one over rho, right? And this is exactly the Gauss map. So this is rho times j. Okay, so this is the proof, the claim, right? And, uh, and then, okay, usually, so let me say, I say that this is the pre-renormalization. So what's the problem? The problem, and we can see it on the claim, these this guys are, are quite small. You know, you have rho, and you have rho times j of rho, which is smaller than rho, of course. And then we will see that if, if we keep playing this game, and we will, so this, these intervals will shrink, and they will shrink exponentially fast to zero, the length. So, of course, and you don't want to do that because we want to talk about convergence of renormalizations. We will be looking for some patterns under renormalization. And then what you do usually uh, is, is just to normalize, to have some specific definite length. So usually R of F, the renormalization of F, the first renormalization of F, is just, is the, the, let's say, normalization in the, sense of, in the sense of normalize of the pre normalization So what this means is that you just rescale by, in this case, will be one over the length of I zero, so one over rho. And then it will be clear why I'm using this, these numbers. So you rescale by this guy. And this will be R of F, okay? So this is just to have the following. In this picture, in this the same previous picture here, you, you will have length equal to one, and the length here will be j of rho. So you are back to some standard definite size, okay? But I I want to keep it combinatorial, so combinatorial. So let me just talk about the pre renormalization And then okay, this is the first return map of, of an irrational rotation around our mark point x0. And then the next question is, okay, so how it looks, a new return. I mean, this is dynamical system. We want to iterate any idea that we have. So the next question, just as before, remember that our first question was this one. And then the new question will be how it looks, okay? And we will do this whole life, how it looks, the, the first return map of our new dynamical system to X0. This is our new, okay? And again, we know that we will not have a continuous return map to, a, to any interval. And again, we will see that we will have it is a pair of maps. Again, we will have a discontinuity, discontinuity at x zero. Actually, I didn't. Let me go back a bit. Let me go back a little bit. So, let me see how I do. I think I know how to not lose this. <laughs> Not so good, okay, <laughs> yeah. So just to I'm making some space here, I mean, I was saying about a, a discontinuous map because it's breaking up at X0, right? Just to be clear about that, so let me draw here. If you think of the lift, you have here length rho, and here length rho, Gauss of rho, with, with a sign of minus, of course. And then you have the identity. And then, you know, you have a rectangle here. I hope the picture is clear. This is the lift of x0. So I was thinking of x0 equal to 1, so the lift I do it at the origin. And then I'm drawing, I'm considering these two intervals, rho to the right, and you know, minus rho j of rho to the left. And then, and remember, these guys were i0 and i1. And then I have these maps. Uh, we, of course, 
uh, we are thinking on the rotation, so this, these guys, let me put this a little bit better, they will be translations, and uh, so they will be, you know, parallel to the diagonal, so something like this. My picture is terrible, I'm sorry. And I, I came here to the tablet just to make some pictures, and now I'm making these horrible pictures. But, you know, let me see. So we are back at the pre-renormalization. This is the graph. Sorry about the picture, but you can see it. Of course, it's a pair of translations. It's the lift of a pair of a small rotation on specific little pieces. And then you can see a discontinuity that I was saying before. OK, just, just because of that. I hope it, this picture is clear. If it's not, you should pause and see, OK, the good part of being on, on the video is that you can pause the teacher, which you cannot usually in real life, but here you can, so you should be, I mean, this should be clear. Anyway, and of course, if, if you are doing, the, if you are playing this game with some general Hobbio, then you will see pieces of graphs of Hobbios, but not straight lines, of course. Anyway, so again, let's go back to, to the, our second question, how it looks, the first return map, of the pre-renormalization of F to our mark point X0. And then let, let's make a picture here. So we have this previous picture again. So this was X0, FQN of X0. This guy is FQ0 of X0, as you can see. And then, OK, this interval, it was a 1. And under the pre-normalization, it comes here. This is FQ0 of A1, OK? And then, so this guy belongs to the domain of FQ1. So one thing that I can do is to start to iterate this guy until, it, and, and it will uh, come closer and closer to X0. And at some point, it will go to the other side, right? And this will produce the new return. So just to be clear, this guy is FQ1 plus Q0 of I1. Then you keep iterating here in the middle. You know, this guy, this is a rotation. So all these guys, they have the same length. Maybe not in my picture, but in reality. So this is what? I don't know. This is F of J times QN plus 1 after QN of I1. And then you keep iterating and, and J grows and grows, and at some point you have the last guy. Now this guy, and I will define the return time R1 if you want, so let, let us write this guy as R1 times Q, oh, sorry here, I, I was saying QN plus one. Whoa, 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 let me go back, so wait. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> this is, you know. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Is that right? Yeah. Whoa. So this is Q1 plus Q0, right? In this setting. I'm sorry, the, 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 the nth uh, moment is coming, but it, it is not here yet. And then here, this was, again, plus Q0 of Q1, right? So I'm saying that this last interval, so the next guy will be around here, OK? So this is the last iterate before you reach the point X0, OK? And then the claim here, let, let me use some red because it's, it's too much blue. So claim, well, this guy that I'm already calling return time, R1 is just A1 from, again, the continual fraction expansion of OK? So again, this guy is appearing. And, and, and you know, this is, uh, so let, let me prove this, and then we will see how we how we manage to put together the, this whole information. But then, you know, again, I'm trying to find a smaller neighborhood of X0 and some kind of return map. So, but first, whoa. Sorry. <laughs> there are some things here that I don't understand yet. OK, about this tablet. Good. So why? OK, and this is clear again. So you have these copies 
uh, you are iterating and you have these copies of uh, I1, right? A lot of them, and they all have the same length because we're iterating a rotation, right? So then what you have is that R1 times the length of I1, that was rho j of rho, is less than the whole length of I0, that it was rho, but then if you go another one, you are on the other side, right? This is the definition of R1. This is exactly what defines R1, right? Remember that the length of I0 is rho because it was a fundamental domain right at the beginning for the rotation, right? Good. And then again, uh, well, you can divide, you have R1 is less than one over Gauss of rho, and this is less than R1 plus one, and then you take the inverse, one over, I'm not so good with this device. This. I mean, I don't know some stuff that he does, but whatever. Good. The inverse of R1 plus 1 is less than J of rho, which is less than the inverse of R1. And this means exactly that J of rho belongs to M R1, which is exactly the way we construct our continuous fraction expansion. Remember, we have this Markov, we have this Markov partition for the Gauss map, and then we were looking at the itinerary of a certain irrational number, in this case, rho. Well, now we know that the second, I mean, the, fir the first iterated just rho, right? Didn't iterate. Now we know that the iterate of rho under the Gauss map belongs to MR1, and this exactly means that R1 is, is equals A1. And of course, you can also, just as before, you can see it here in the traditional definition, because this means that R1 is the integer part of the inverse of J of R, right? Well, okay, so this, this is clear, but then, this gives you a bit more. And why? Okay, what I'm here, here. Good. So why? So if R1 is equal to A1, let me write this again. Remember that the iterate that we were looking before, it, 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 trying to understand our return map, it was this guy. R1 times Q1 plus Q0. But now we know that R1 equals A1. So this means that this iterate, R1, Q1 plus Q0, is just A1, Q1 plus Q0. And this is, if you remember the recursive formula, and I hope you do from lecture one, this is exactly Q2, right? So this return uh, times Q uh, are, are, are now, it's now clear why we call them return times. So let me draw the picture again. So you have x0, remember this guy was fq0, x0, this guy was fq1 of x0, and then what we know, we were playing this game here, we know that this last guy here is fq2 of x0, because of this computation before. Okay? So these are, this, this is why the name return times. And of course, uh, this is just the fact, if, you know, if, if you know these arithmetical properties of the continuous fractional expansion, maybe you knew it before watching these lectures and reading our book. This is just the fact that the QNs are the, the denominators of the best approximations of the rational row, right? This is just the dynamical translation of that arithmetical fact. It's just that. But you know, we, since this is a dynamical system course, I prefer to play this game here. Okay. And then, okay, uh, you define your map. So, so now it's clear the names. Uh, this big guy was I0. This big guy was A1. This guy is A2. A2 is X0, FQ2 of X0, right? 
And then it's clear that the second pre-renormalization of F uh, will be just FQ1 restricted to I2 and FQ2 restricted to A1. And you will have the same game as before. So now you have these maps. This is X0, FQ2, much closer than FQ1. dynamically closer, and since we are with the rotation, uh, this also means, okay, let me see, yeah, okay. in this case, means closer Euclid, in the Euclidean legs. Of course, in general, it's just dynamically close, right? And then, you know, the iterates, one will come here, the other one will, will do this, and you have a return map to a specific interval, but of course with a discontinuity at x0. So this is the second renormalization of f. And of course, uh, th there is also this nice uh, formula, recursive formula, about the uh, Lebesgue measure of these domains, a0, a1, a2, and remember this translates to your unique invariant measure in the general case. Now, we already knew that the Lebesgue measure or the Euclidean length of I1, it was rho j of rho. And now we know, I mean, I'm claiming that this guy will be rho j of rho j square of rho. So the product of, of the orbit of rho under the Gauss map is appearing, is determining this length. And you know, this is kind of very well known for rotations, but again, I think uh, people should be able to play this game that I'm playing here uh, before going into deep stuff about renormalization theory, you know, track, whatever. And uh, what I say, well, uh, and, and why this claim is true? Well, you know, the length of I2 is what? Is the length of I0 minus all these copies of I1 that we have, right? You have the whole I0, you have these copies of I1, and then you have this little piece for uh, forgotten. This is I2, by definition. So its length is exactly this. And then, you know, we have this information. This is rho minus A1, rho J of rho. And then if you put J of rho outside, you will have what? You have 1 over J of rho minus A1. But this is the integer part. A one is the integer part of one over j of rho. So this is the fractional part of one over j of rho, which is exactly the Gauss map applied to j of rho, which, in dynamical notation, means j square of rho, right? So and that's it. This is how we renormalize. Just to put the, the standard. Oh, sorry. Yeah, here we are. If I try to do that, I wouldn't be able to. Whatever. So inductively, then, okay, inductively, inductively, you know, you have some n bigger or equal than one, and then uh, you have these intervals, i n, which is x0, f q n of x0, and then you have a n plus one, which is f q n plus one, x0, and we know how it works. So here you have x0, this is in, and this is in plus 1, right? And then in plus 1 is exponentially smaller than in. In fact, as an exercise, it's already clear why, but the length of any of those guys is the product as it was clear, at least for the first cases of the iterates of the Gauss map. So this is an exercise. And in fact, it's an exercise in the book. But you know, the, the exercise by, you know, if you receive this formula in general, it, it might be not clear how to prove it. Well, you should prove it by induction. We already know the first uh, three cases, right? A0, A1, and A2 were computed before. This formula holds, and then you should try to prove that uh, inductively uh, this formula holds for any m. So this I'm talking here for any m bigger or equal than one. The one that was the picture, as I was saying, this guy is fqn, and this guy is fq1 plus one. 
of F0. And then, of course, the pre renormalization so the return map. But you know, this, these intervals are shrinking exponentially fast, right? So again, and, and I will say this uh, right now, but you need to uniformize the length, somehow rescaling, otherwise you are missing everything. You, you, in the limit, you, you will have a point. Everything collapses. I mean, there is no limit somehow. So, but just to make this a uh, combinatorial definition, this is the map FQN acting on IN plus one, FQN plus one acting on AN. This is the nth renormalization and the, the pre, sorry, and then you know you have this that some people call interval exchange map of two intervals in this case, because precisely we are playing with rotation. So this guy comes here, and this guy comes here. So it, it really looks as a as a return map. The thing is that these maps are, are, are different. They are not the same. They have a discontinu discontinuity here at x0. And this guy, of course, is f qn plus 1 plus qn of x0. So, uh, everything is kind of elementary, but, but at the same time, there is a, a lot of, of, of structure appearing. You know? So somehow, just for a rigid rotation and a mark point, we just get a whole sequence of pairs of maps and define it on some domains which are shrinking geometrically and now just to you know to, uh, to don't have this problem we normalize so finally and this this was the, the idea of this video rl is the normalization of, of this guy and by normalization, I mean rescaling by one over I n. Okay, so ju just to say something, I mean, this, this, you you can you can normalize with the other interval. I mean, this is not so you know so canonical. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but if you do like this here, that your length will be one. And here, your length will be the Gauss, the n plus one iterate, the Gauss map of your uh, irrational rotation map. So, okay, so this video, I will stop here. It was just, you know, to, I, I think this is kind of elementary, but you know, you should take a pen, a, a sheet of paper, and try to, to, to understand these, these pieces, because after this, the situation will start to get <laughs> more and more complicated. As usual, so this combinatorial construction, all the combinatorial uh, uh, claims or statements in this uh, video that, that I just did in my in the tablet, hold for any minimal circle homeomorphism, okay? Because of the, of the topological conjugacy with your with the rigid rotation, and these geometrical statements about Euclidean length are actually statement about the event measure of this these uh, important domains, and then they translate into statement about uh, the measure mu of, of, the, of this interval. So for your unique invariant measure, remember that we are dealing with uniquely ergodic systems, you have this information. So all, for instance, this little exercise about uh, this here, you will translate it by mu of i n equals all this, uh, this whole problem, okay? Okay, we'll stop here, and now I'm coming back to the slides to start, you know, to, to, to state a theorems about renormalization of critical circle maps. So now your mark point will be a critical point. You will start to renormalize around this guy, always rescaling and try to see if this converges to something or not. As you can see, you are dealing with a dynamical system on an infinite dimensional phase space. So you have the space of all your critical circle maps with, say, irrational rotation number, and then you are iterating the renormalization operator, and then you want to see if there is an attractor, if there are periodic orbits, if this converges to something, or you just keep iterating without accumulating anywhere. And this is 
uh, what we will discuss, but then we come back to the slides. Thanks. Okay, good. So we are back from, from the tablet. So now we know what is uh, the renormalization operator in the circle case for circle homeomorphisms with irrational rotation number. So just again, the same picture that I was drawing. So now you have any F, of course. Remember that I explained it just for the rotation, but everything is combinatorial. Here you have the QNs. Of course, these graphs are not straight lines at all. They have a critical point. And this is a picture for just one critical point, and I am renormalizing around the critical point. As you can see, uh, here, AM plus 1 is equal to 4. So you can count this little iterate here. We are not so close to a diagonal. Uh, as if your map is too close to a diagonal, then you will spend a long time before to pass to the other side. This means AM quite big. Uh, but of course, being renormalizable means that your graph does not touch the diagonal, otherwise you are not passing to the other side, okay? So you, you may spend a long time, but, but you need to pass to the other side. Good. And okay, so RNF, as I was saying, is the rescaling of this guy, where these intervals are given by the return time skewer. Okay, this is just what I was explaining. And in fact, you, you don't work only with a renormalization of circle maps, so, so you, you take a bigger space, which is the space of commuting pairs. So in order to have more flexibility, so now the phase space of the renormalization operator is an infinite dimensional space, as I was explaining. And uh, so what it is a critical commuting pair? Well, the idea is to abstract this picture. So a critical commuting pair is a, a pair of maps, uh, eta and xi, so the, they are the, defined on compact intervals, uh, glue in the at the origin so the domain of eta is uh, you know at the right of the origin the domain of psi is at the left and then they commute at zero this is the same at, uh, that was happening before and then you know zero will be the single critical point this is just for one critical point so for any x outside the origin the derivatives are positive but the origin is a critical point, a non-flat critical point with the same criticality, okay? And then you have more. Uh, this second item is kind of a commuting condition. We are saying that at zero they commute, but it's, it's kind of uh, stronger, what we need, that that's not, uh, that's not enough. And then we will draw the left and right derivatives of the compositions. They are well-defined uh, in this order, right? The left derivatives of uh, eta, composed with psi and the right derivatives of the composition of psi with eta. And then for each j until r, r in general will be, you know, with the smoothness, three, four, but then you can take, you know, say infinity, analytic, whatever you want. And then until some order that in, in my definition they coincide, but it could be less, uh, you may have uh, analytic pairs that commute uh, up to order three, or something like that, but here, let's put the same, these derivatives coincide, okay? So this means that you can extend, uh, this is a lemma, it's proof on the book, you can extend a little bit these maps in order to actually have a commuting condition, so they extend and they commute on a whole open interval around the origin. So this second condition is not only at, at the point zero, uh, it holds on a whole open interval around the origin. So this is a commuting pair is, is more flexible than just being, you know, FQN and FQN plus one for some F uh, defining on the circle. And this is the space where you define the normalization operator just as before. You have these guys. Let me put uh, some pictures. This is a commuting pair. These are the same pictures that I was drawn before, but, uh, you, you know, just for any maps et and psi with these properties that I was mentioning. And then, you know, if the orbit of this uh, extreme point, psi of zero, uh, the orbits under, the or its orbit, sorry, under eta pass to the other side, then you say that your map is renormalizable, uh, and then you renormalize in the same way as before, okay? So the same definition, everything is the same. You can see these pictures I was drawing before, these pictures on my tablet. And, and you know everything is combinatorial. So, but at the same time, you know, I think I think you 
you may want to stop this video, <laughs> take a sheet of paper and a pen and try to play with this to understand really the, the definition of the operator. You are thinking compositions, you know, you should try to really understand the definition of the normalization operator. It's explained on the book, but you know, I, I, I don't have so much time to spend here, but I hope the tablet moment was good. And then, okay, uh, let me put a remark, which is related to the second part of lecture one. Uh, if you have a map which is periodic under renormalization, so it is renormalizable, you renormalize it, it is again renormalizable, you renormalize it, and at some point you recover the, the original map. We don't know if these guys exist, they might not. Well, actually they do, but we will see it later. But anyway, say that you have periodic orbits for the renormalization operator, then the rotation number, uh, the continuous fraction expansion of the rotation number will be periodic because Remember that, uh, well, you know, this, uh, the number of iterates that you need to pass to the other side are exactly the coefficients of the continuous fraction expansion, as we, as we just saw on the tablet. So you will have a periodic continuous fraction expansion, in particular, of course, uh, bounded type uh, continuous fraction expansion. So any periodic orbit of the normalization operator has an irrational rotation number of bounded type, okay? And uh, this is why when I introduce uh, in the first lecture a uh, bounded type, irrational numbers, I was saying that uh, it appears naturally in the theory, renormalization theory. And this is, this is the reason. And you know, uh, as, as always when you're studying the dynamical systems, if you have periodic orbits, you want to understand them because maybe they attract or if they are, even if they are not attractor, they have a stable manifold, so they attract important sets. So of course, this is just something that understanding periodic orbits of a, of a chaotic dynamical system, it's important to understand the dynamical system itself. And the renormalization operator will not be an exception of this principle, uh, despite the fact that we are on infinite dimension, right? So we don't know uh, periodic orbits. In fact, uh, we don't know anything. You may you, you have an infinitely normalizable guy, you start to renormalize. It might be the case that it does not accumulate on anything. Uh, our phase space is not compact. <laughs> and in fact, it's not even locally compact. So you take a closed ball in our phase space, which is the space of commuting pairs, and it won't be compact. So we don't know nothing yet about the existence of periodic orbit, the existence of a tractor. Uh, re recurrence is not given a priori. This, and this is due to the fact that we are with an infinite dimension of phase space. So this is kind of the source of, of uh, or the reason why normalization theory is so difficult, but at the same time so interesting. So okay, and let me, I was saying that there is this fundamental principle that smooth conjugacy follows from exponential contraction of normalization. This is a principle, but now I want to give uh, specific statements. So there is a theorem, uh, if this was proved by Edson and Wellington de Mello uh, for critical circle maps with a single critical point, and then it was extended in collaboration with Gabriela Esteves for the multi critical case. So, for Lebesgue, almost every rotation number, so there exists a full Lebesgue measure set such that if you take F and G, C3 multi critical circle maps with the same signature, of course such that their common rotation number belongs to this set A, then you take corresponding critical points, you start to renormalize. If the orbits of renormalization converge together exponentially fast in the C1 metric, then F and G are conjugate by a smooth diffing. So this theorem gives you a way to prove smooth rigidity, uh, let's say uh, a sufficient condition to prove smooth rigidity. If you are able to prove exponential contraction in the C1 topology, then you are done, okay? And let me say an important remark that if you have just one critical point, then C0 contraction is enough. You just need to prove it on the C0 metric, but then if you have more than one critical point, you need this data in the C1 metric. And the reason why this difference is kind of natural, so when you renormalize around a critical point in the single, case, in the single critical point case, you have this guy well, well controlled. But when you have more guys, these return maps, 
Remember that these guys, they cover the whole circle before to come back, so they have critical points. These are uh, regular points for one iterate, but since they will hit the critical point before the return, they are critical points for the return. And then you want to control the position of these guys for RNF and RNG. And to do that, you need some C1 information, which is kind of that, okay? So for level, almost every rotation number, and this include this includes, sorry, I will say this in a moment, the bounded type case, uh, you have this statement. What about the other uh, rotation numbers? What about rotation numbers in the complement of this uh, full Lebesgue measure set A? And then there is a theorem by Hanin and Teplinski saying that in the complement, the, the same principle holds, but it is kind of more difficult because this, these are the worst uh, rotation numbers in this sense. And then uh, what they prove is that you need C2 exponential conversion. So you need to prove the exponential conversions for C2, for the C2 metric. And what you get is a, a C1 difficult unit. Okay? Not C1 plus alpha, only C1. Uh, so, but uh, as, as I said before, uh, it, sometimes this is the best that you get. You, you, you have these cases where you have C1 conjugacy, which is not C1 plus alpha for any alpha. So this, uh, in some sense, this is a sharp state. But of course, you need to prove in the C2 method. Okay? So this is uh, what I meant before about uh, exponential contraction of renormalization implies smooth regime. Okay? And then, uh, okay, and, and these are uh, the theorems that we want to prove in order to get the smooth receipted result uh, that I state at the beginning of our lecture, okay? So this is what you need to prove. And uh, just for to complete this statement, let me say, just write down what is the set A. So A, you have uh, the rational numbers, A0, A1, and so on such that these coefficients satisfy these three properties, okay? And, uh, okay, I, I'm not saying too much. These three properties, they appear in the proof. So in the, in the paper by Edson and Wellington and the proof that you will find in chapter 11 of our book, you will see that, that you need, at some point, you need each of these three conditions. And, uh, and then you say, okay, the proof works for this guy. And uh, the good thing, uh, as I said before, is that this guy has full level measure. So these three properties together, they hold for Lebesgue almost every uh, irrational number of zero one. So we, and this is proved uh, in Appendix A of our book. The first two conditions is not so difficult to prove that they hold uh, at, for almost every number. But then the third one is kind of more tricky. But you have the complete proof. And as I, as I said before, all bounded time numbers belong to this set, which is clear now that you have the definition. It, it, be clear that if the ANs are bounded, of course, you, you satisfy this condition. Okay? So then, uh, the, the, the whole problem that you need to solve in order to prove the smooth receipt result that I stated at the beginning is to prove exponential contraction. And then, okay, how to prove exponential contraction of renormalization? Well, let me start to say that this is a challenging problem. This is kind of quite a difficult problem in any a renormalization scheme in any renormalization setting, this program, uh, uh, as for those who, who know uh, about one-dimensional dynamics, uh, is kind of parallel to the unimodal problem, right? And well, those who knows, those who know the unimodal program knows how difficult it is. You can find most of the theory in the in the book by well. Uh, Wellington de Mello and Sebastian Van String, One Dimensional Dynamics. Uh, the last chapter of the book is uh, fully devoted to renormalization theory, and then you will see how difficult this is. There you can find a proof, for instance, that uh, for unimodals, exponential contraction of renormalization implies smooth rigidity. Of course, the attractors uh, in that case, this is for bounded combinator, the attractors are cantor sets, and then you prove that you have a diff identified these cantor sets. Any case, anyway. So this is a challenging problem. And as a first step, what you need to prove is pre-compactness of orbits. Uh, what I mean by this is that, uh, as I said before, you are renormalizing, maybe your renormalization orbit does not accumulate on anything. Uh, so uh, 
you need to prove that orbits accumulate on something. This is the first step. So you want to prove pre-compactness, which is not for free in the infinite dimensional case, okay? And then you have seen this on lecture three, let me be quickly. So you have the partitions PN, the standard partitions, and then you say that your map F has bounded geometry at some point X. If you have comparability for adjacent interval, uniform comparability, uh, for your whole sequence of dynamical partition. Uniform means that you have a constant K that works for any level of, any deep level of these partitions, okay? So you have this comparability. And then uh, you can consider, okay, uh, I will take the set of points in the circle X such that as I look at the sequence PN of X of dynamical partitions associated to X, I have bounded geometry. Okay, so B is the set X such that F has bounded geometry at X. And you know, you might not have bounded geometry at all. So a remark is that if you have a rigid rotation and the rational rotation number is not uh, of bounded type, so it is unbounded, then the set is empty. For any point, you will not have uh, bounded geometry. And this is an exercise. But as, as we saw in lecture three, as Edson explained in lecture three, there is this theorem called real bounds, which say that the critical set is contained in B. So if you take a critical point and you consider dynamical partitions around the critical point, you do have bounded geometry. So you always have the critical set uh, inside this set B of bounded geometry. And let me just to make some propaganda, let me make some comments. So how large is B? And of course, it's not empty, uh, as, as we just saw from multi-critical circle maps, and you can prove that it is invariant under F. This is done in the book. So, uh, in particular, it is dense. This set B is always dense in the unit circle. And moreover, this is proved in the book. It's a theorem by Michel Armand, which says that if your rotation number is of bounded type, then B is the whole circle. In other words, and uh, uh, for at any point, you will have bounded geometry. Okay? Good. This is proving the book. I'm not saying anything about the proof. So, however, just to make some propaganda, a couple of years ago, we proved with Edson, and there are some remarks and comments on the book, that for Lebesgue, almost every rotation number, this set is quite small. It is meager in the topological sense, in the sense of bear, and it has zero measure for uh, your unique invariant measure. It's mu f is the unique invariant measure of f, then this set has zero uh, measure, okay? So for Levesque, almost every uh, rotation number, you know, the, you should try to pick up a critical point and work, work with it. Otherwise, if you take just some random point X, you might not have bounded geometry at your point, okay? This set is bigger and zero measure, you know, for the relevant measure. So this, we proved it a couple of years ago, so I, I wanted to do some propaganda. But okay, let's keep the let's uh, keep with us the the good part, which is that the critical set is contained in B. This is the classical real bounds of our and Shantek. And moreover, and this was explained by Edson, everything is proved on the book. There are some quite uh, nice consequences of the real bounds. Uh, one is the CR CR minus one. So if you have a CR critical circle map, the return times are bounded in CR minus one topology. So the renormalization orbit is CR minus one bound, okay? And this implies at once pre-compactness, uh, at least in CR minus two, you know, you can use an, a Arcela Ascoli standard argument uh, to, to have a key continuity and then pre-compactness, okay? So this is the first step. Orbits, uh, renormalization orbits, they do accumulate somewhere. Now we need to know where, but this is already quite uh, an important information, which is a consequence, as I was saying, of the real bounds of Hermann and Jantec. Another important consequence is the negative Schwarzian for the return. So each uh, element of the normalization operator for n big enough uh, has negative Schwarzian derivative at, at its regular point. So let me be clear here, we are not asking our map to have negative Schwarzian, it's just a C3 map, we don't know anything about the negative Schwarzian, but then the return maps, after some, you know, n larger than some n zero, will have negative Schwarzian for free. And this is kind of a geometrically important uh, 
information. And moreover, and this is a, a, a main theorem that Edson explained, you have a quasi-symmetry. So the homeomorphism that conjugates two multi-critical circle maps with the same signature and identify a critical points. Yeah, uh, yeah, already, sorry. I was thinking if I already explained something, but yeah, I did it. So this guy is quasi-symmetric, okay? It's not just an audio, it's a quasi-symmetric homeomorphism. This is a theorem which is proved, I think this is chapter seven, if I'm not wrong, in our book. And uh, Netson explained it in lecture three. So we do have this, right? I'm just summarizing some information. So again, our problem is to prove exponential contraction. And then, uh, first of all, you, real bounds implies pre-compactness. And moreover, real bounds implies QS rigidity. Okay? And then we move uh, to, to, to the next step. And, and, and for this, we, we will separate in two cases. Uh, you have first real analytic dynamics, and then we will discuss the case of uh, CR dynamics. And actually, the real analytic case will be on lecture five, and here I will try to explain how to relate both of those. So let me be more clear. Uh, in the real analytic case, so this means that your multi-critical circle map, it is actually a holomorphic map on an annulus around the unit circle. And then uh, you will use holomorphic tools, uh, which are explained in chapter 15 of our book, uh, in order to deal with the problem of uh, proving exponential contraction. I will say quite quickly just, uh, you know, the key words of this, but this will be discussed in lecture five. So first of all, uh, okay, if, if your guy, so now, now you, you know, you are renormalizing and, and you have this commuting pair, which is the nth renormalization of F. One thing that you want is to extend it to the complex plane as holomorphic maps, since you are assuming that your dynamics are analytic. And there is a way to do this. And this was a, an important contribution by Edson, Edson de Faria. The name is holomorphic commuting pairs. They are explained in chapter 15. So you can extend. Uh, of course, your map extends holomorphically, and, and you cannot choose anything. The holomorphic extension is unique, but you can choose the domains that you will dynamically study these guys, and this is not an easy task. This was done by Edson, and then you can define the renormalization of these guys, so the return maps for complex domains, so you complexify your dynamics, and you complexify the renormalization operator. Moreover, there is something called the pullback argument shows that you can even complexify uh, your consumacy. Of course, not as a holomorphic map. Your, your consumacy is a homeomorphism. We are just trying to prove that it is smooth. But we already know that it is quasi-symmetric. And then the pullback argument shows that you can extend it quasi-conformally. Of course, any quasi-symmetric uh, one-dimensional homo extends quasi-conformally. But being a consumacy, of your complexified dynamical system. So it was a consumacy in the intervals. Now you have your dynamics extended to the complex plane. You can extend the consumacy, still being a consumacy, and in a quasi-conformal fashion. So this is the pullback argument. And now that you have this, you can get a stronger uh, form of pre-compactness. The previous one was called the real bounds because we were in the real line, and now it will be called complex bounds. This is a beautiful and important uh, result in any renormalization scheme. We have provided a proof of this in chapter 15, a complete proof of the complex bounds. And, uh, and this means that this holomorphic, so this holomorphic map, uh, when you iterate until they come back, they have some expansion. So what is happening is that they are compactly contained on its range. And, uh, and what you got, so you have a topological annulus, which is the range minus the domain, and complex bound means that this annulus, when you compute the conformal modulus of this annulus, it is bounded from below. It is never close to zero. You have uniform constants uh, bounding from below the conformal modulus. Okay? So this, everything will be discussed in lecture five. Then you need uh, more ingredients. I will be quick here. You know, some model family, which can be the Arnold family or any Blaske the Blaske family that, you know, has been discussed, it's on the book. 
And then you need something uh, which is a, a major contribution by McMullen that, you know, we will discuss it later in chapter five. And in fact, this is for bounded type, you already need all of this. And if you want the unbounded to solve the unbounded case, you need all of this and uh, the theory of parabolic bifurcation. Uh, you know, this is a, an important theory in holomorphic dynamics. You can think of UAD, Shishikura, and so on. So all these things will be discussed in lecture five, but I just want to state the theory. So theorem, and this has been proved in different pieces by Edson and Wellington, by Misha Jampolsky, and also there is a paper by Misha Jampolsky with Kmelev. And, uh, and if you put, I'm putting everything together, you can prove the following that, here is the important part, the renormalization orbit, they do converge together exponentially fast, uh, and this is for any CR, so this is for the CR metric for any R, and of course, this is kind of the magical things coming from complex analysis, right? What, what you know actually is that there is a convergence in the uniform norm, in the C0 norm, for the complex extension. And of course, this norm dominates all CR norms. So, you know, you, here you don't care if it is convergence in C1, C2, you have convergence for any R. Okay, and this is for any irrational rotation number. As I said, for bounded type, uh, you need all of, of the previous item, uh, items here. For unbounded, you also need parabolic bifurcation. Anyway, so as I was saying, this will be discussed in lecture five, so I just wanted the statement. We do have exponential contraction for real analytic data. So here you have the proof. I'm not giving the proof, I'm just writing one statement, but this proves all the good rigidity results that I mentioned at the beginning uh, in the real analytic category. So for real analytic dynamics, all those results were proven here by Edson, Wellington, and Michelle Yampolsky. Okay? So as I said at the beginning, our contribution with Wellington and Marco was to solve the CR case, to relate the CR case to the analytic one. So again, uh, let me try to explain that part. So again, we are in this problem of, pro of proving exponential contraction, and then the real bounds give us, gave us the pre-compactness, and then the QS rigidity, and then using quite uh, sophisticated tools from holomorphic dynamics, you can prove the exponential contraction in the real analytic category. And then just uh, to finish lecture four, I want to mention that, so how, how do you do it in the finite, uh, so for finitely smooth dynamics. So I started this lecture with, with smooth rigidity statements for C3 or C4 dynamics. So how, how do you do it? And then you will use the analytic case. And then let me write uh, two statements which imply the smooth rigidity statement, which are, you know, the exponential contraction of normalization uh, in the CR case. So if you have CR unicritical circle maps uh, with bounded combinatorics, then you have exponential contraction in the C0 metric. We proved this with Wellington. And moreover, if you, wa if you want to get rid of the bounded type condition, as I explained at the beginning, you, you need one more derivative. So if you take C4 critical circle maps with the same irrational rotation number, and here is any irrational, then you can prove the exponential contraction in the C2 metric. And remember that here you want to, I mean, you need to improve in the C2 metric because you want to use Hanin and the please result. So you need to, to prove the exponential contraction for the C2 norm, okay? As I mentioned, let me say before, this second theorem is probably true. It's probably true most likely in the C3 case. It should be true. But then, you know, we weren't able to prove it. We need this fourth derivative. This is what we know at the moment. So how to relate uh, the renormalization orbit of CR maps with those uh, of real analytic maps? And then there is a theorem that we call the shadowy theorem, proved with Wellington, where, where we were able to construct a compact piece of real analytic dynamics, and, and I'm calling it K here, with the following properties. So you take any C3 guy, you start to renormalize, and the renormalization orbit, it will converge to this compact piece of analytic guys exponentially fast. 
So renormalization of CR guys converges exponentially fast to analytic one. Okay? So let me give the precise statement. This is for any R at least three, and the estimates that you get are in the CR minus one metric. Okay. So what you get is that given NEF, uh, critical circuit map with irrational rotation number, and this theorem holds for any rational rotation number, there are no arithmetical conditions, then you can construct a sequence Fn inside this compact piece with this property. The nth renormalization of F is exponentially close to Fn. And moreover, you can do it in such a way that you have the same combinatorics, the same irrational rotation number for each. When you are renormalizing, at some point you are close to this compact set, and you can shadow the renormalization orbit of the C3 guy with a, what it is, a, a posteriori, a pseudo orbit of analytic guys. And an important thing here is that there are no assumptions on the rotation. So uh, we have a sketch, a proof of this result of, of this construction in chapter 14. Uh, I, I'm not going, I mean, we have no time in, the, in this short series of five lectures to explain this whole construction, it is quite difficult. It uses complex analysis. Some parts are inspired by the proof of the complex bounds. So, so you will use a hyperbolic metric, but of course, these guys are not analytic, so you will have distortions of the hyperbolic metric, and, and you will need to be able to understand how you distort this, this uh, hyperbolic metric. So first, you need to decide, how you will extend to the complex plane your C3 maps, or CR, in such a way that you are able to control distortion on some point KG or hyperbolic metrics. And there is a way to do that, which is very nice, at least this is what I think, which are called the asymptotically holomorphic extension. This is an object from analysis. There is a way to extend these CR maps of course, to CR maps in the complex plane, they, they, it won't be better than CR, but with a local property in such a way that on a smaller and a smaller scales, there are suitable hyperbolic metrics, uh, Riemannian metrics, that, that you can control. So the distortions are smaller and smaller as soon as you are looking at smaller and smaller scales. Unfortunately, this is what you do uh, in renormalization theory. You are looking at smaller and smaller scales. So I think the, it is a symmetric, a very nice construction of this set. And this is the main link between what is was known for real analytic and, and what we now we have for smooth ones. So you renormalize, you are close to analytic, and then since you know how to control the analytics, you ended up controlling the smooth guys. There are some arguments that you need to do, but for the bounded type case, this is it. The problem is that at any time that you are, you know, you are doing this little jump from your renormalization orbit to this pseudo orbit of analytics in the compact piece, there is some error, potentially small, but there is, and then you need to be able to control how this error propagates under renormalization. And this is kind of difficult, at least uh, in the unbounded case. For bounded type, it is not so difficult to control this because renormalization, uh, will be made up by composition of a bounded number of maps, right? The, the number of guys that you will compose is bounded because you have a bounded type rotation number. In the unbounded case, this is not the case. Your renormalization will be made up by compositions and these compositions can be arbitrarily large. So you need to prove, you need to control, uh, you need to have a, a modulus of continuity of renormalizations that allows you to, uh, you know, uh, control how this error propagates. It is enough to have a Lipschitz constant. And then, let me give a statement, a Lipschitz estimate for renormalization. So, and this theorem, if you want to prove it for bounded type, uh, it is not so difficult, but in the general case, so let me show you here right now, this is for any rational rotation number, it is kind of difficult. You see that the theorem is about a Lipschitz estimate. We are saying that if you renormalize uh, zeta zero and zeta one, there is a Lipschitz constant. This is uh, the content of the theorem. Renormalization is Lipschitz for the C2 metric. 
But of course, uh, actually, if you said like that, this is not true, so you need some properties. And then the first one, so this Lipschitz estimate will depend on two data, some constant k, we come from some geometric control that you need to, to require for your commuting pairs, and also some constant epsilon that I will explain right now. So let, let me be more clear here. Given k, there exists epsilon, no, sorry, yeah, given k, so there exists epsilon and L with the following properties. So take, you take commuting pairs, C3 commuting pairs with the same irrational rotation number. Both need to have negative Schwarzian. They have real bounds. This means that some relevant intervals are not too small. And, uh, and moreover, you need C3 bounds. So the C3 norm of these two guys must be bounded by K. And, uh, right? So this uh, Xi and Eta are for, for the two modes, right? Xi zero and Eta zero, and also Xi one and Eta one. And then these guys, they need to be close, but this epsilon is, is uniform. Given K, you have some uniform epsilon, but they need to be on a ball of radius epsilon on a C2 ball. And then you have this estimate. Uh, so this is quite a difficult theorem. It is proved in chapter 13 of our book. And uh, I, I'm not making much more comments here in, the, in this lecture because, you know, I, I think I have to talk uh, too much. You know, just let me say that the Lipschitz constant only depend on the on the bounds that you have a priori, not on the rotation number. So L is independent of the rotation number, and this is the important part. It can be unbounded; it can be terribly unbounded. It will be the same as soon as as you have this geometric control, this negative Schwarzian, and so on. So it seems that you have a lot of uh, conditions here, but remember. First of all, you will always use this for guys that have the same irrational rotation number. The negative Schwarzian, remember that you have it for free. If, if you have been renormalized sufficiently enough times, you do have negative Schwarzian. You do have real bounds. You do have C3 bounds, at least if you start with C4 guys. And this is the reason why in the theorem with Marco and Wellington, we need C4 guys. And then, okay, you will use the theorem only when the maps are sufficiently close or the last uh, condition is not so harmful. So all these conditions are needed. In particular, something that uh, it might not be clear at the very beginning, why you need the same irrational rotation number. So you are normalizing one step here. Maybe you can think that it could be enough if you know that the period of normalization, so the first coefficient in the continuous fraction expansion is the same because the normalization operator is defined only looking at, at this first uh, coefficient. So, but this is not the case. If you don't have control on the following terms, uh, it, it is not true, it is definitely not true that you have a Lipschitz constant, okay? This is kind of technical, I'm sorry, but I just wanted to state the theorem. And, uh, and the proof, it, it, you know, is on chapter 13, is kind of hard analysis and, uh, and of course, uh, we can talk about this during the colloquium if someone is actually reading it and, and trying to understand. So I think I will stop here. Thank you very much.